this uh, aggressive critique of every inherited idea, it, it will destroy us, first to misery, and then to weakness, and then to dictatorship. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall for The Spectator in London. Today I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Yoram Hazoni, author of the books The Virtue of Nationalism, The Jewish State, The Struggle for Israel's Soul, and his most recent book, Conservatism, A Rediscovery. Dr. Hazoni is also the chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation, president of the Herzl Institute, and leader of the National Conservative Movement, which only last month enjoyed its conference. Dr. Hazoni, thank you so much for speaking with me today. My pleasure. Thank you for making the time for me, Winston. I wondered if we could start with some perhaps semantics or some basic questions. Um, and your most recent book, Conservatism, A Rediscovery, really goes, gets into the political philosophy of, of um, conservatism. And, and there's some things I don't fully grasp, but I wondered maybe if I could ask a very simple question. Uh, what is conservatism? Well, conservatism is a, is a political standpoint uh, that sees the, the center of politics as being the, uh, the conservation and transmission uh, and strengthening of uh, the nation through time over generations. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's appropriate today to contrast it with liberalism because the, the two things have been somewhat confused. Um, a, a liberal is someone who begins in a different place, begins with saying, look, the heart of politics is the, uh, the freedom and equality of the individual. And uh, the, 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 the role of government and the role of politics is, is to secure individual liberties and, and, and equalities. Now, of course, uh, it's possible for a conservative, and m most conservatives are concerned, among other things, with, uh, with individual liberty. Uh, but because conservatism begins with, uh, with, it begins with the collective, it begins with the nation, and says, what have we inherited? What are our traditions? What are our interests, uh, the interests of our nation? What, what do we need to do in order to make it stronger? That means that a conservative is, is always going to be balancing and trading off uh, in, in areas in which uh, liberals simply, you know, very often simply assert, well, look, individual liberty is at stake here and therefore we already have our answer. In, in your book, you describe it as, uh, let's say, uh, conservative nationalism as, as a unity of different tribes making a pact together to, to, to work cohesively. In the first half of the book, I, I couldn't help but think, where's the role for the individual in this collection of the tribe? And in the second half of the book, I felt that your definition of conservatism seemed to incorporate liberalism. It seemed to incorporate the values of John Stuart Mill, John Locke. Uh, the, the 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 freedom of of the individual. So I couldn't quite uh, couldn't quite separate conservatism and liberalism in my head. Maybe you can clarify that for sure. me. Sure. Well, look, it, it, it's very important to uh, to recognize that conservatism is going to be different from one one nation, one national tradition to another. Um, what whatever is uh, an appropriate conservatism in, in Britain is not is it's simply not going to be the same as an appropriate conservatism in uh, in India or, or 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 in Russia or 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 somewhere else. Um, in this conservatism is very different from both liberalism and Marxism, which are universalist theories and uh, claim to give you the answer about what every country in the world at all times in history should, should be like. Uh, so, so that uh, it's, it's certainly the case that, uh, that an Anglo-American conservatism uh, is, is going to include uh, uh, strong, strong elements of, uh, uh, of ind individual liberty, pick up in praise of the laws of England by the, the, the great um, common lawyer and, and jurist and political theorist, John Fortescue. This is a book that was written in 1470. It was written in the Middle Ages. And the first thing that Fortescue starts to tell you about is uh, the separation of powers and the, the checks and balances between the king and the parliament and uh, the, uh, the relationship between 
uh, private property and individual liberty? And he answer, he, he says, wh why is it that all across Europe people s say that in England we're the freest, we're the fr freest people in Europe? And he starts to explain how the common law constructs individual liberty, for example, by forbidding the king to uh, to enter a property without the permission, even even you know. Uh, a, a, a farm, a, a farmer's home is not is not something the king is allowed to enter without his permission, much less to take something. Mm -hmm. All right, and and by the way, many of these elements that you know that we find already in in uh, medieval uh, English political tradition, ma many of them go go all the way back to the Bible and are often explicitly connect, connected to the Bible. So the most important parts of liberalism certainly do do exist. Uh, within the common law tradition, within the conservative tradition uh, in Britain and in America. However, um, w we can see the clear clash uh, in the triumph over the after the fall of the Berlin Wall for 30 years. International a liberal internationalism became kind of the uh, the dominant ideology of you know of of both Labour and Tories, both uh, Democrats and Republicans, and this was mostly tr true across Europe. And um, and what you see in this liberal internationalism is a uh, is liberalism unbound from any kind of conservatism. Liberalism in uh, in almost you could say in in kind of a, a pure sense in which the freedom of the individual uh, to establish a, co a corporation to uh, to take take his or her company and you know, move the factories uh, to China without any concern for. Uh, what effect that has on 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 the workers in Britain or in America? We we, we got to see thirty years of pure liberalism. Mm. I think the Brexit and the Trump movement, and uh, in general the, the 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 return of a a nation centered conservatism, uh, is a, a clear rejection of uh, the idea that you can simply take the freedom of the individual and turn that into everything in politics. Can, can we, sorry to, I don't want to stall you in, but just back to definitions, because you, you talked there about pure liberalism and also the liberal worldview. And you mentioned it's Marxist worldview, which is easier to sort of understand. It's that there's different classes of people, there's an oppressor and an oppressed, and there's a power dynamic with, with, between them. But where, what is the liberal worldview? Uh, how would you define that? Let's take John Locke. The axioms in the Second Treaties of Government, the premises on which he explicitly bases all of his political theory. Number one, all human beings are perfectly free and perfectly equal. That That's the cornerstone. Number two, moral and pol political obligation only comes into existence where you've consented. In other words, if, if, if I didn't agree to, uh, to be bound by um, by your claims in one way or another. If I didn't agree to it, then then I'm not bound. I don't have any obligations. Mm -hmm. And number three, uh, he says the purpose of government is only to uh, pursue and establish uh, these um, uh, equalities and liberties, which 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 all re all rational people he believes will will come to that. Now, this is an extremely simplistic and shallow, in my view. Uh, form of thinking about politics, it didn't really emerge victorious as kind of like the uh, uh, the ultimate answer to all questions in politics until after World War II. But as this liberalism has uh, has advanced over the, the 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 last couple of hundred years, um, the, uh, the the job of conservatives has been to uh, to attempt somehow to uh, prevent extremely abstract concepts of uh, f the perfectly free and perfectly equal individual from taking over every aspect of society. So let's take an example. Um, in in a traditional, any kind of traditional conservative politics would 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 recognize that there are different nations and they have different laws, and the 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 national government has a responsibility to maintain, in general, the the good and the interests of the people who, who the government represents. Mm -hmm. um, and and so a question like, you know, what right do uh, you know hundreds of thousands of foreigners have to enter the country this year? For for a conservative, it. it it, it's obvious that it, it depends on whether having hundreds of thousands of foreigners entering the country is going to benefit and strengthen uh, uh, 
your people uh, econo economically, but also also in terms of culture and 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 the the cohesion of the of the society. Mm -hmm. That that that's obvious to to conservatives, but a liberal says, "Well, hold on a second. Um, we we believe that all individuals are perfectly free and perfectly equal. Mm -hmm. So, what right do I, as let's say an Englishman, what right do I have to 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 tell someone who's uh, coming from from Nigeria or or from from uh, uh, Poland or anywhere else. No, you're not allowed to enter this country. You think it'll be better for you, but I'm going to stop you. Mm -hmm. And I, I I think that you see this uh, that that you see this easily. This 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 uh, hesitation uh, among uh, British elites, American elites, certainly in the European Union, where you know where where uh, eliminating borders is kind of like an explicit aim of the entire EU enterprise. Mm -hmm. What's what's going on here? What's going on here is fundamentally uh, the liberal assumption that a foreigner is is just as good as you are, and therefore you you have no right to prevent them from entering the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a very, very uh, clear point on which uh, liberals are on one side and conservatives are on, a, on another. Not necessarily just as good, because I think conservatives would say an immigrant is just as good. It, it, it's not a moral judgment, right? As much as saying that they are, they have an equal right to the land. Is that what you mean? Sure, but but you know, a, a, a conservative uh, who who sees someone crossing the border illegally will say, "Look, you're a criminal. You've you violated the laws of this country." Mm -hmm. And I think quite a few liberals at this point. They're uneasy with that. You know, what, what right do we have to, you know, if, if the laws are unjust, and maybe it's just unjust to tell all these people they're not allowed to enter the country, whether there is such a thing as, uh, as, as a nation, whether it exists in history, whether people belonging to one nation actually should treat one another in, in a different way from the way that they treat mm -hmm. people from, from, from other nations. Uh, this, is, this is the heart of politics yeah. today. Is there a danger that without that liberal offset, it can go too far. The obvious example being that, let's say 1930s Germany, we all know how that ended. There was a union of the different tribes, except one tribe was not just excluded, but we know how we know how the, the story there. And and so that conservatism needs that liberal uh, dialectic to keep it from going too far in, in another direction. I, I think you're right. Let let me just say something about some, something about 1930s Germany because that example is um, it looms so large in, uh, in in the public imagination. If you read Mein Kampf, and I do not recommend <laughs> reading Mein Kampf, but but if you read it, you'll see that uh, that uh, Hitler never says um, uh, my ideology is biological imperialism. My he does say that. Germany should be the uh, lord of all the earth and the mistress of the globe. So, I mean, he, he expresses the desire for Germany to, to take over the entire world, but he calls that nationalism. And uh, so, we have a um, we have a semantic hmm. we have a semantic problem. This is a jingoistic nationalism in many parts of the world, even today. The word nationalism, you know, I, I I'm I'm from Israel. I'm going in a few weeks to India, and places like India and Israel, the, the word nationalism is a positive word; it's not a negative word. Uh, but the, the, when when it's used as a positive term, most decent people use the term to mean um, uh, a a world of independent nations. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a principle. It's, it's not a utopia necessarily, but nationalism is a is a principle that says that in general, we're better off if the world is governed as uh, many independent nations, rather than uh, w uh, one nation attempting to create a, uh, a a world empire. It's nation statism might be a less triggering word for a British or American uh, audience. It, 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 it could, could be. be the problem with um, your know, people say to me, "Why why do you use the word nationalism? Why can't you say use patriotism?" George Orwell, for example, uh, argued for that. And the problem is, since we are talking about semantics, first let's be clear about the idea rather than than the terms. The idea is a world of independent nations. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we're trying to describe. And the reason that I use nationalism is because that's that is actually the traditional word for that ideology. And I'm I'm not that interested in uh, altering 
uh, my vocabulary because of Hitler. I don't want to learn political theory from Hitler. The, the word um, uh, patriotism, it's a perfectly fine word, but patriotism means my love of my country. I'm a patriot. I'm an Eng English patriot or I'm, I'm an Israeli patriot. So pa patriotism is, is the love of your country. Mm -hmm. But now we move into political theory. We're looking for a general principle. What, what, what term do we use to describe the, the idea that the world should consist is better off if it is governed as a world of independent nations? The term patriotism doesn't come close to capturing that, mm -hmm. and nationalism yeah. simply does. It, mm -hmm. it, it's just an appropriate use of the term. So since I don't have another word, yeah. So I, I, so I, I, I use that word. Well, I actually first came across your work in 2016 in the wake of the Brexit referendum, very much going against the what was the loud, uh, typical and rather cliched uh, response that this oh, this is a racist movement, whatever. And you went into the deep biblical roots of nationalism, which you then. Uh, uh, went into further detail in your books, The Virtue of Nationalism. And that for me was new information. And I found that very interesting. And actually, nationalism is an ancient theory. Yes. I wondered for listeners who hadn't heard that, the biblical roots of it, if you might uh, give a light introduction. Okay, a light introduction. Um, first of all, it's, it, it is Im important to take everything you learn in university with a grain of salt. Uh -huh. And... Uh, since World War II, there's been uh, th there's a, a a discipline called uh, uh, nationalism and ethnicity studies, uh, you know, which which has a a few thousand members. These professors who are paid full time to think about the subject, and the founders of the discipline um, are uh, almost all of them either uh, Marxist anti nationalists or liberal anti nationalists. So it's a it, it it's a it, it's a discipline founded by anti nationalists, and uh, and they go around telling people that look nationalism was was invented at, uh, during the French Revolution, uh, or maybe they push it back a little bit and say okay it was invented in 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 Britain a hundred years earlier, um, but uh, there 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 is at this point even in the universities there's a uh, a small but high quality <laughs> group of scholars. Um, who, um, who've been uh, looking to try to understand where does the idea of an independent nation, as opposed to a nation that's subservient to some empire, where does that come from? And you took it back to the 12 Hebrew tribes of Israel. Uh, well, it, 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 it's, it, it's not me. I mean, there was a, uh, a, well, they br did. a brilliant scholar named uh, Adrian Hastings yeah. uh, who wrote a book already in the 1990s called The Construction of Nationhood. His thesis is, look, where, where does the idea of an independent nation appear? And he claims that throughout throughout Western history and also outside of the West in in uh, in Africa and Asia, he he claims that the the ideal of an independent nation appears where the um, uh, where the the Bible and specifically the Old Testament, when it's translated into a local language, that's where you where where you see it appear. And he takes mm. uh, he he takes uh, medieval France and he takes Ethiopia. He looks at all sorts of examples. Huh. Now, that, there, um, there's pros and cons to this theory, but let let me give the light introduction that you asked me for. So, um, when you read the the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the background to the story is that. Uh, the great political orders in in the time of the Bible during the thousand years that are being described in in the Old Testament, um, the Egyptian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Persian Empire, these are very very different civilizations. But what they have in common is that in every single one of them, uh, the God sends uh, the king uh, to conquer the four corners of the earth, and why? Uh, because that's what's going to bring peace and prosperity. Now, n notice, I mean, we usually think imperialism. Oh, it's just evil. No, actually, I mean, there's a there there's a a strong argument behind all of these imperial ideologies. The the argument is, if we can eliminate the independence of all sorts of small peoples, we will eliminate war, 
and will will allow material prosperity to flourish mm. in the absence of wars that come and uh, destroy all the cl- crops, bring famine, and kill millions of people. This, this sounds like a defense of supranationalist states like the EU. Well, you, you know, the funny th- the funny thing is that this. Uh, this ancient ideology is still very much alive in the EU and the World Economic Forum and and the World Trade Organization. Uh, But in the Bible, the the remarkable thing about this is despite the fact that that the imperialist ideology that, you know, it has has a positive motivation. It's not only about uh, uh, raping and pillaging. Um, But despite that, uh, the the Israelite prophets, the, the prophets and scholars who wrote the Bible, they they disagree about many things, but they're united in their objection to human empire. Mm-hmm. They 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 construct this idea of uh, Israel as an independent nation. They celebrate uh, leaving in it, uh, uh, the departure from Egypt and the Israelites, the 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 twelve tribes uh, uniting under a single uh, uh, under a single ruler. They they celebrate. Um, this as being um, uh, a, a I don't want to say that it's an ultimate political principle, but it's a it's it's a central political principle. It's not it it's not and it's not just for the Israelites. The prophets start start to tell you about uh, uh, other nations mm. and and, uh, and and how Israel should should suffer because of their loss of independence, and they envision a future in which. Uh, you know all the, these famous lines about uh, the wolf lying down with uh, with the lamb. The, these fam- these famous lines are metaphorical description of a world in which nations will stop trying to be imperial and and great nations will allow small nations to chart their own course. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the central political teachings of the Bible, mm-hmm. and it is one that has inspired. Uh, national independence movements uh, throughout history, mm. uh, in, in, including especially in uh, in England and in America. So that is an example of the Israeli people of a shared God who built a nation from that. But we're in Britain. This is a multi-ethnic state. There's multi-religious state, as in America, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. Can a nation be a nation without a founding binding religion underneath it i think that the answer is is yes but it uh it, it it's a little bit complicated we should always look at nations as a uh a, as a collection of tribes uh and not, that's not only because that that's the way that the nation is described in scripture uh, but also in in reality that there simply are no nations that 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 are internally homogenous all nations are uh, are 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 diverse. So, um, you know, if we go back to to just for a second to founding moments, um, the uh, the 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 first um, great attempt to establish an English nation is uh, is is with Alfred, and he's uniting diverse tribes. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the same with the the Dutch and their struggle for independence. The same with uh, the, the Americans and the the, the 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 great question in American in, in the American Revolutionary period, the great question is in many ways the same as the the biblical question is is it possible for these for these 13 very, very different colonies with very, very different cultures, these 13 states, is it possible to unite them as a single nation? Now, if you accept that all nations are internally diverse, to one degree or another, then I think that the 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 question of you know how do we do, how do we uh, unite a modern a modern nation mm-hmm. which is uh, internally diverse I think the question it's it's a very important question but I think it becomes less um, it comes many people s- seem to feel that it's just impossible that you know as though we're facing for the first time in history. Uh, um, the, the 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 need to bind mul- multiple ethnic groups or multiple religions in a single nation, I actually think that this is an eternal problem. That it, it's an unending problem throughout throughout recorded history, and um, and the the answer is going to be somewhat different in each case. All right, in 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 Israel, we the people 
may not know. In Israel, there's a uh, there's a small people called called the Druze. The Druze are a uh, a Middle Eastern people. They have their own religion. Uh, it, it's not Judaism. It's not Islam. It, it's not Christianity. It's it, it's some kind of an interesting interesting fusion, and um, so so it's a a people with its own identity. That we, in in Israel we have a few hundred thousand Druze, and um, and from the founding of the state of Israel, uh, this this uh, Druze people has uh, has been has been loyal to the the state, meaning. Um, they, they said, "Look, we we want to support Jewish independence. We're a small people. We're not going to try to, you know, claim that 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 we're equals in size or in strength. But we'll serve in the military, and uh, and and this relationship. I don't want to say that it's um, that it is, uh, uh, you know, without any kind of tension. All human relationships have tension, but it's been very successful when Druze." military units have ceremonies. They fly the Druze flag next to the Israeli flag at the same level. This kind of experience of, of, of smaller peoples, it, I, I think you, you can find it almost everywhere. You, the fact that someone is a minority doesn't mean that, that they have to be excluded or abused or that they will be disloyal. Well, perhaps the problem is, or I, I, it could be better posed in that there is a majority, let's say in Israel, and they have there has been a majority in America, in Britain, but in Britain we are now a minority Christian country. In America, it seems that the country is splitting in two because they have completely different conceptions of what the, the founding myth of the country, the founding story of the country, and they don't, they can't agree on what that is. It's no longer about a majority that binds and a, a, a tolerated minority. It seems that there's a, a splitting up. So I wondered. There, that's a bigger problem, right? That's a that's a different well, problem sh for sure. Because we we all know that that civil wars are are a real possibility in every nation. Mm -hmm. um, preventing civil war always involves, although people don't like to talk about this, but but avoiding civil war always involves having some kind of a dominant group that is strong enough, on the one hand, to say, look, our uh, our culture, our traditions, they're going to be the main traditions. Because of that, we can also bring in other groups. Um, and I wouldn't even say necessarily uh, tolerating them. It could be just a an alliance. We can go into alliance with other groups that will accept us as the leadership, but th they'll have an honored place with their own traditions that are that are different. The problem is, exactly as you say, that, that in the United States, um, We've seen that uh, be lost. When I was in college, th those were the Reagan-Thatcher years. No one in the United States had the slightest doubt that America was a nation. N no, one, the, the, the question didn't even arise. You know, maybe some some uh, uh, radical professor would talk about it, but everyone knew that America was a, w w was a nation. Everybody knew that that historically America was w was. Uh, um, uh, was was an Ang Anglo Protestant nation that had brought in a a, a, a large Catholic um, uh, minority and also Jews and others, but the 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 historic character of the American nation was was not in doubt. The kind of questions that were asked was how can how can we do justice to the black minority? It seems that they they they, they they've suffered injustice. What what do we do about it? But the question of America being a nation was never a question. Uh, much has changed. In part, it's because there's um, uh, there's a very large proportion of the pop population that are immigrants. But it, but that's not really that's not really the problem because you know there there have been other periods in American history where fifteen percent of the population has been foreign born, just like today. Mm -hmm. And and th th there were tensions, but you didn't feel like the country was about to split in two. Do you feel that way? Do you think it is? About to split into? Would you, like, well, look, I'm not. I'm not going to make a uh, a crystal ball. Are you prediction. concerned about the future of America? Oh, yes. yes, absolutely, absolutely. No, no question at all. The degree of tension between a woke neo Marxist left, uh, which is now that that may be a small minority, but but the way human politics works is that a small minority, if it's if it's vocal enough and organized enough, it can dominate much larger 
uh, much much larger political groupings. So I mean, we, we should we should never forget that that you know the 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 Bolsheviks were never more than five percent of the population in the Soviet Union. Human populations are very very often governed by a a small, motivated, aggressive minority, which one way or another seizes control. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, what I'm describing is it's it is a dynamic that. It, it's not just a dynamic in you know in a coup d'état in dictatorships. This this is true in, in democratic societies it's also. also. Mm -hmm. That if you have a a, a small, highly motivated, uh, ideologically coherent group, then their concerns are heard much more loudly than the concerns of other people. And human beings naturally have a tendency to say, "Look, well, if they're so loud, then they must really care." Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're we're looking in America. Um, and you're more concerned with the the progressive my small that small group on the on the left rather than the small group on the right is that a concern of yours well look uh, it it sort of depends on who you're talking about uh, what's happening on the left is that um that the the democratic party which used to be um a a version of a liberal party uh you know and institutions like uh uh, like the New York Times or Harvard University, uh, those were kind of the the ideological homes for the old liberalism. Um, that old liberalism, look, I have all sorts of disagreements with it as a conservative, um, but but as a conservative, for many years growing up, I had no problem reading the New York Times. I I knew that I didn't agree with you know the slant that they put on many stories, but. They had conservative writers. They they thought conservatives were legitimate, and uh, and you know th th there were all sorts of things that I could agree with uh, the old liberals mm -hmm. on. Uh, on. Um, uh, th that's gone. It's disappeared. Uh, it twenty twenty was a watershed year, uh, the year in which um, the New York Times began firing people for being old school liberals. Mm -hmm. The the year in which uh, Princeton, I went to Princeton, Princeton University, um, uh, erased Woodrow Woodrow Wilson's uh, a name from the from the school of uh, the, from the Woodrow Wilson School and from Wilson College. Mm. That was a year of cultural revolution, and that cultural revolution brought to power a non liberal ideology, which took over the media, the universities, Hollywood, government bureaucracy, even the military. Your defense of conservatism is one that it's families and then communities, perhaps that's local communities, but th there's very much, the progressives would do it with identities, sexual identities, uh, ethnic gr groups, even if they're not people who are actually in a functioning community together, they will use the words like the fallacy of the word community, they actually use it. It's, so I sort of see a mirror, and actually I still get a bit of a, so I'm honest, and perhaps this makes me a liberal, I get a little bit triggered by the exploring tribal, I particularly don't like tribal when it, it's uh, ethnic groups on the right, and, and, and so there's a, there's a kind of, there's a difficult side to both things at play there. For sure. Um, look, both, uh, you, you, you're right, there, there, there's, uh, there, there is a, a certain commonality between Marxist and conservative critiques of liberalism, um, and, and in in my book, I mean, I, I I like when I'm teaching to to try to get the students first to understand what's what the strengths of a of a point of view is before I yeah. dive into saying what's what's wrong with it, because look, it, it, Marxism has to have it has you know very often liberals and conservatives talk about Marxism like it's one big lie. Uh, the, 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 there's reasons for that, but it, but it isn't really true. The because the 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 strength of the Marxist worldview is that it recognizes certain realities that liberalism denies. Like, the, well, the, the as you said, the Marxist worldview is based first of all on identifying actual human groups. Mm -hmm. you know, Marx calls them classes, but basically he's t he's talking about human groups. The the fact that human beings. Uh, form cohesive groups, and that those groups compete and struggle against one another, and that sometimes they they exploit and abuse one another. That's that's a reality that can take place in liberal society, and liberals can can really be blind to it because because they're always talking about the individual, and they don't they're not aware that 
it's possible even in liberalism, even in a democratic society, for human beings to form groups and to abuse one another. And so the, the reason that Marxists have such a, a, a powerful uh, uh, hold that the, the, that the attraction to Marxism uh, of its diff different kinds of Marxism is so powerful for young people is because uh, Marxist instructors, they say, look, the liberals are lying to you. L let me j just look around you. Do you see human beings being individual or do you see human beings forming into groups okay. which abuse one another? And, and, and so the, the Marxist instructors, it, it, you know, it feels to the students like they're ripping the veil off of reality and you, you see the truth. After correctly recognizing that, there, that, that there's always tension and struggle among competing groups in every society, after they say that, then they say, well, look, uh, the dominant group, the strongest group is inevitably exploitative. Uh, it, th their assumption is that every group will always abuse and exploit every other group if they get the chance. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's not true. I think I think there's that, an element of truth. Absolutely, there there uh, th there is such a tendency, but it doesn't. Uh, but I, what I don't accept is the the Marxist claim that inevitably every uh, dominant group will exploit and oppress as much as it can. And B, I don't accept that the only answer to that is to destroy the ruling class. And that I mean that's classical Marxism, and that part of it is very obvious in woke neo-marxism mm -hmm. where th they're not talking about economic classes right now now that the, the, but but the ruling class that they have in their mind the you know the the uh, the straight white male and and you know his fraternity and his patriarchy their goal is to destroy that as a political um a, 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 as as a politically influential uh element within society mm -hmm. so the old Marxism is expressed in this woke neo-Marxism in the, in the new cancel culture and progressivism with this goal that there's no possible relationship between a dominant group and the other groups other than oppressor oppressed. Mm -hmm. A conservative will say, come on, th there's always a strongest group, but um, peace in society and justice are normally achieved through a kind of negotiation, through wise rulers that understand that, that the society will be stronger and more cohesive if uh, the different groups are loyal to one another. And how do you get to that loyalty? Well, you get to that loyalty by by trying to understand what the different groups, not, you know, not every single thing they want is something that they can get, but the, the, the goal of a just ruler, of a just government, is to try to understand what's important to, what's most important to each group and see how a balance can be uh, attain. Now, it's not always possible. Sometimes there just has to be struggle, you know, until one side wins. But the main goal of politics, in my view, and this is, you know, this is where I disagree with uh, radical rightist theorists, uh, Nazi theorists like like Carl Schmitt, who will tell you, no, politics is always about uh, uh, about who's your enemy and and annihilating your enemy. Hmm. No, actually, most politics, most of the time, is about trying to. Uh, uh, navigate the competition among groups in such a way that everybody gets something of what they want. Everybody is honored to a certain degree, at least, and uh, from that to build a cohesive society uh, in 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 which you know there are no groups that 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 feel that they've simply been uh, eliminated from the game completely. In practical terms, you you say you're concerned about America. How can that unity return? Do you think? I, I don't I don't know if it can. I, I mean, I, I I can I can tell you what brings unity. What brings unity is um, is honoring one another. Okay, which is something liberal political theory doesn't almost doesn't recognize, but it's central in the Bible and it's central in conservative thought. Mm. Um, you, you treat someone as a cause that they have influence that they're not. Uh, ignored contemptuously, but that somebody's paying attention to them, and if something is of concern to them, then it then then it becomes a concern to others. Y you know, you can you can still just get the videos of Reagan Mondale or Reagan Carter debates, or go back to Kennedy versus um, Nixon in the 1960s. The entire posture is, you know, is look, my esteemed colleague from the other side. You know, the assumption is 
inherited mm-hmm. from uh, the UK, obviously. The assumption is that the, the opposition is loyal. The assumption yep. is, mm-hmm. look, our policies are, are better, but if you know, if uh, if my colleague wins the election, so of course we're going to support him. We're going to collaborate in trying to do the best we can in this country. We'll, we, you know, we'll, we'll we'll disagree on on some things, but on the important things, we're going to work together. That's the assumption. There's this constant um, uh, handing over of of uh, gestures of uh, uh, respect and even affection and good humor, and and that that creates. A, a very real bond of mutual loyalty when both sides are doing that. We can see in America the terrible, bitter pulling apart, which reminds us of the eve of the American Civil War. Mm. But what we don't know is um, if we do the right thing, if we do what we ought to do, um, whether, you know, whether we might not be able to turn it around, whether God might not help us a little bit if we um uh if we make one one last effort to hold it all together in your book uh, conservatism a rediscovery you there's almost a I, I took it as a revisionist history that actually the the second world war the 20th century wasn't the victory of liberalism as much as it was the victory of christian uh, liberal democracy as much as it was christian democracy when you see let's say Hungary or Italy and certain religious conservative movements growing it. Does that give you, is that the sort of Christian democracy you're sort of imagining? it? Yes. Um, I don't believe that there is any force strong enough to def- to defeat woke neo-Marxism except for political Christianity. Now, I, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I have plenty of uh, issues with with Christianity, both in theory and in practice, but when I uh, look at this cultural revolution that that we're going through, and and the way that you know every couple of years that that pass brings us to an even more aggressive imposition of revolutionary ideas. When I when I say revolution, I mean that in the negative sense, tearing apart everything that has been inherited that was any good, and I'm not claiming everything we inherit is good, but tearing apart f- first, you know, they began in the 1960s, uh, first with with uh, God and scripture, and then from there to the destruction of the idea of nation and family, and finally they've gotten to the the, the elimination of the ideas of man and woman, and it, look, it, there, there is no end to this. The, this this uh, aggressive critique of every inherited idea it will destroy us first to misery and then to weakness and then to dictatorship. But this is the sort of point I was trying to get at earlier is that it, without a, an underlying majority religion to bind yes. a, a country, a nation, can there really be a nation? Uh, but so just on political Christianity, what is political Christianity? Is that theocracy? Every society has a majority framework. Okay. And as, as look, as a, as a Jew, um, I, I'm, you know, one of these groups that kind of, you know, doesn't fully fit into the the old dominant uh, uh, ideology or worldview in America or in Britain. But those dominant ideologies, the old British Christian synthesis, the old American Christian synthesis, uh, they they were compared to, you know, compared to uh, historically to what what we've known. They, they were very generous to Jews until. All sorts of other minorities, and um, and sometimes not so generous, but yeah, sure. No, of course. You know, look, it would be easy for me to go into listing the history of of things that I find objectionable mm-hmm. about the history of Britain. But what on earth is the point of this? Mm-hmm. Because if 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 you're just trying to say, um, I don't care what happens next. Let's just destroy the whole thing. So go right ahead. Just name everything that was ever wrong with it. But you know, usually when you tear the whole thing down, what comes afterwards is much, much worse. Mm-hmm. Okay, and how many, how many, how many examples of of that do we need? I mean, the 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 whole communist and Nazi and fascist project of the twentieth century was 
uproot and destroy whatever has come and we'll just invent something. We'll use, you know, science or, or, or some new philosophy in order to invent everything from scratch. What good ever comes of that? I, I mean, nothing. Mm -hmm. No good comes out, out of those revolutions. If you want good, you take, if you actually want good, a conservative will, will, will say you, you want to improve things. So take the existing inherited order find don't don't tell me all about how it can be redesigned find the one thing that is trub most troublesome from a perspective of justice and let's repair that and see how that goes that that's a conservative approach all conservatives will agree that 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 what you inherit is not perfect and that repairs are necessary they all agree the question is are we going to focus on trying to fix one thing or do we listen to these you know um, theorists about how, yes, I can simply revise all of civilization. So my answer is no, don't do it. The cultural revolution that's coming, there's no evidence that it works. There's not, they don't even claim it's going to work. They only claim that they're achieving justice by destroying. Mm -hmm. So where do we have to go? We're, well, we, we, don't, we don't have a lot of choices here. Britain is, uh, is, is a country, as you said, in which, in which Christianity really is a minority. Um, but I think that those of you who, uh, like me, are not Christians, I think need to ask themselves, because this is, this is the choice. We're not going back to the old liberalism. The old liberalism was unable to defend itself against woke neo-Marxism. It's unable to. It's not strong enough to do it. In the end, if you want to back an order that is going to be strong enough, then you're going to have to support some kind of an accommodation with, um, with the with the old Christian framework that gave stability to life. The liberal theory of separation of church and state, you know, which is that's an American theory. It's strange to impose it in in Britain, where there's you know a cross on the flag and an established church. But uh, I've I've come to understand that that the that the um, the uh, American liberal uh, uh, theory of separation of church and state that it's become very powerful. It's it's become very intuitive e even here in the UK. I well, think in America, what's into, uh, it sort of seems to get ignored is that even though there is a separation, philosophically, the 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 foundational political texts are do have religious presuppositions. So. They're referencing God, a creator, and so actually, even though the the political institutions are separated from the from the church at the foundation, it is founded on a religious worldview. Well, that's true, but I I, I would take take it further. the uh, The principle of separation of church and state enters American constitutional law in 1947, after World War II. It, the you know, so we we all kind of live in this optical illusion in which. Everyone somehow thinks that that America had separation of church and state since the founding, and there's there's zero truth to it. There's no truth to it at all. Hmm. The, the 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 First Amendment, the purpose of the First Amendment was to allow the the, the church establishments and the 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 different kinds of uh, religions in the different states to be uh, independent and not to be interfered with by the Central American government. America was a Christian nation. And it was recognized as a Christian nation by law or Christian people by the American Supreme Court until the 1930s. And so what, what we are dealing with as part of the post-war liberal experiment is let's, let's see what happens if you take uh, God and Bible out of all of the schools in the country by force. You know, all, m most of the country has this or that kind of relationship with Christianity. Uh, in, the, in 1948, the particular first step that the Supreme Court took in the United States was that in 1948, in the McCullough case, Chicago schools, here, here's, here's what the Chicago schools were doing. They were allowing um, a Catholic priest, a Protestant minister, and a rabbi to enter the school for certain times during the week and to offer instruction um, in, in the different religions. And, and students and their parents could choose which, which, which they would go to. And, and the, they also allowed students to not go if they, you know, if, 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 if there were a good faith uh, uh, um, dissent. That is what was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1948, is this marvelously, you know, pluralist, generous um, attempt to allow students to learn something about religion. Huh. When 
that became unconstitutional. And then a few years later, Bible was banned. So that was, was the domi- that was the first domino. Yes. yes. And, and, and look, it, it, this is an amazing thing that we're watching. It, it's, it's literally 60 years, it, two generations from the time that Americans say, okay, we're going to eliminate, just eliminate God and scripture from, from the schools. We'll limit it to you know, an hour a week on Sunday. From that moment until the you know these mind-numbing debates about you know about w- 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 is this one a woman or is that one a woman? It's sixty years. years. Yeah, and you 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 can't tell me that there's that there's no, no causal relationship because the because it's been proceeding in a in 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 a straight vector for sixty years. When G- G.K. Chesterton makes me think of Chesterton, he said, when people no longer believe in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. As the months are passing, woke new Marxism takes on the trappings more and more of, of an organized religion. And, you know, it it will have its gods and it will have its liturgy. I mean, it's going to be pagan, it's not going to be Christian. I, I just think people need to make a choice. I'm not telling people what to believe. I'm telling you that if you want to save your country, but also if you if you want to be able to build a stable family, if you want to be able to save yourself, I don't mean in the Christian sense. I mean in the in in the personal worldly sense. If you want to be able to save yourself, you you have to join communities that are resisting this. Mm-hmm. It, it it it's the only way to have a decent life. One thing I wanted to ask you, which is maybe a little bit of a, a left turn here, is about, well, you mentioned immigration earlier in this conversation, right at the beginning of this conversation. And in Britain, we are due or it's expected that we'll have a million net migrants into the UK this year, uh, which is double last year. And uh, pre-Brexit, I think it was never more than 330,000 at its peak. Uh, A conservative argument in favor of that is that we have a um, population crisis and that we're heading into population decline and economically it's good to have immigrants to fill that gap for the for the economic progress of the of the country to sustain that aging population and to make sure that there is a critical mass of working people to keep the the state together are you in favor of that argument or against the argument well i'm i'm against the argument but i i also want to try to uh, push it out of the conservative zone. I think it's a liberal argument. Uh-huh. Ar- be- it's a liberal argument because it refuses to acknowledge that there is such a thing. There is such a thing as an English nation, mm-hmm. and it it has a historic character. It has a certain culture. Of course, it's possible to absorb uh, immigrants so long as uh, the the immigrants are highly motivated to become English, to adopt mm-hmm. the English culture. And so long as the numbers are small enough, so that you know, so that England can actually uh, b- bring them in in a successful way. Okay, so with the with the birthing crisis, assuming you agree with me that there's a population crisis, maybe I shouldn't assume. There's no alternative for for a nation, a people that wants a future. There's no alternative to having children, and the the assumption that foreign adults can replace um, the the children raised in English households it, 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 it it's an absurd assumption it, I mean I'm not saying that the that the economic measure doesn't have some kind of uh, uh, value and truth to it the problem is it's as is often the case with liberalism it's this little partial truth the the the, the broader truth is that that a, a Britain that is not having children has no future. And these islands will end up being, they'll, they'll, they'll end up being taken over by some other country at some point. If you, you want to have a future, you can't avoid the basic responsibility of, uh, of human beings to any society that they love, which is to bring children into that society and to raise them with, with, with its value and worldview. But something has happened in which people are not having children. Yes. People can't afford it or they don't want it. What is the conservative response to that? Is, is it for government to support families? A government certainly has to make sure 
that, first of all, uh, that um, financially that the inst incentive structure is um, is uh, towards getting married, staying married, and uh, and having as many as as many children as possible. That's the uh, that is the the way the instru incentive structure should be built. But human beings are not primarily economic. Lots of people in history have had many, many children when 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 they were poor, mm. and 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 also during the the after the industrial revolution, not only in uh, on farms. the The principal thing is to give honor to marriage, mm -hmm. to tr to traditional classical marriage, to to child child raising. Also, by the way, to serving in the military. I mean, the, the, these are things that. If the the prominent and the influential people, the leadership of the country, if they are not constantly giving or honor to these things, then then people will then then you can't expect the society, you know, to revolt against the entire the entire elite and the entire leadership and say no 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 we're going to have a different set of values that that might, might happen. happen. Mm -hmm. But I think I think people simply underestimate the the uh, the the influence that I mean just just think about how Donald Trump reshaped the way that not just in America that you know tens of millions of people think in America and in many other countries or the the, the way that Barack Obama did or or, or 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 Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan Thatcher. People are shaped by their leaders to a, a degree that we just don't want to admit. Mm -hmm. And our, our leader, leaders are not, they're, they're scared. They're scared to say conservative things. And so they're, they're scared to say something like, you know, um, g getting, getting married young is, is, is better than putting it off. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, ha having three or four children is, is better than having no children or one child. Serving the military is better. Mm -hmm. uh, staying married is better than getting divorced. Every it, political leaders are scared to say these utterly simple things. What do you think, apart from that, are the other key issues, apart from the, the population um, uh, uh, decline, that that we need to think about or start putting our minds towards, um, for you know, in the political realm? Well, the the, the, the big the biggest issues first first national independence, you know. It, um, Brexit isn't isn't actually done. I mean, the, the, there the, there is still a um, a resistance to uh, allowing um, parliamentary democracy in Britain to be independent of all sorts of decisions being made by all sorts of bodies in other places. So, f first of all, national independence, um, and then um, I would say uh, immigration. Family and and uh, and children and the great cultural revolution the 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 the, the woke neo Marxists that must be with right with the woke neo Marxists who who whose aim is to to take over the schools and use the schools to convince yeah. everyone that mm. that you know that that uh, that the old family is a, is an instrument of yeah. uh, of uh, white male oppression and needs to be destroyed yeah. So my last question: What's the future of the National Conservative okay, well, Movement? Okay, look, the National Conservatives is somewhat it's somewhat of a redundant term because the the, the nation is always important to all conservatives, but um, but it, it's appropriate at this moment to use it as as a as a slogan as a symbol because it makes it clear we're not talking about the old the the, the so called conservatives who are trying to uh, create one world liberal order. Mm. We want independence for our nation. We want to restore um, beneficial national traditions, certainly at the level of the family, but prob probably at other levels as well. Um, and this is, you know, it's interesting that uh, I, I said conservatism is different in in every country, but the 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 the, the objection to liberal internationalism to to the new world order, that objection is very similar in. You know all sorts of countries. So you, you you can you can you have Catholic majority countries and post Christian countries and uh, and Israel is a Jewish state and India is a Hindu state and the effort to resist 
the imposition of this globalist fantasy, which will be a globalist nightmare. Mm. Uh, you know, that opposition actually it, it creates an interesting uh, alliance of different different peoples in different nations. Mm -hmm. what, what a pleasure to um, to have national conservatism appear in Britain. It's the historic home for um, for much of what we value in Western civilization. We're, we're all cheering for you, and, yeah. and um, it's, it's deeply meaningful, not just for you, but for the rest of us. Well, Dr. Hazoni, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you.